Good morning and welcome to First Church. It's nice to see all of you that made it out one time this morning. Um, I just wanted to lift up a couple announcements. We have the Liberty University Chambers Singers Concert here at 4 o'clock today. And if you are at all interested in joining in Prodigal God, that study is still going on throughout Lent. We have more books. You can pick them up at the Welcome Desk and still consider joining the studies. We have them at 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock on Wednesday. And if you'd rather just pick up the book and read it yourself, please do that. It is a book worth reading. As we move into worship today, I just wanted to point something out to you, that we call this a worship service. And sometimes I think we use words, but we don't think about what they actually mean. So worship, of course, is us coming and lifting our eyes to God. We're coming and we're praising him for everything he's done for us this week. We're coming and we're praying for the things that only God can do for us. We're coming and we're giving our talents, our time, our resources to him. And then this remarkable thing, we are coming expecting to encounter the God of the universe. But we also call it a service. And I think this is interesting. In the church, when we think of serving, I think we think of like Hungry Hearts, which is, or volunteering with youth and children's ministries, which is, or we might think of, well, some people are serving at worship, some people are ushers, or they are greeters, or they are musicians, or they are acolytes, or they're scripture readers. But I'd want to say to you this morning that every single person in this room is coming today to serve God with their worship, and that this might be the most important thing that human beings can do for God to serve him. So we welcome you this morning to worship.
Would you please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship? The Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and, and the, the dry land, land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today we would listen to his voice. And please join me in prayer. God of wilderness and water, your son was baptized and tempted as we are. Guide us through this season that we may not avoid struggle, but open ourselves to blessing through the cleansing depths of repentance and the heaven-rending words of the Spirit. Amen. other this morning, in the, sort of the theme or the same feeling of that praising of God that we just sang, I want you to do it a little differently. 
I want you to introduce yourself to someone, maybe find someone you don't know, and I want you to tell them something that you are personally thankful for today. Some need that God has met for you this week, some um, maybe person or experience through which you've felt his love. So greet one, greet one another this morning. Yep, if any kids want to come up with us for the children's message, we would be glad to have you. I'm curious as to what you all are grateful for this morning. Would anybody like to tell me? I'm sure you are as anxious to share with me as all those adults were to share with each other. What are you thankful for this morning? Micaiah, you get to go first. Something that you're thankful for. Oh, wow. Okay, well, I'm going to come back to you. Nathan, is there something that you're thankful for? Okay, well, that's, that's a great thing to be thankful for. I think he was thankful for his brother. Emily, is there something that you'd like to say that you're thankful for? Easter. Easter. Oh. Well, that was cute. I'm thankful for that. Ava, I'm sorry, I don't want to shove the microphone in your face like a stage mom. Is there something that you are thankful for? Elsie, is there something? <laughs> oh, the look on her face when she looked at the microphone, like it was, yeah. Josh, is there something you're thankful for that, that you'd like to share with us? Donuts. I'm sure there's a lot of people this morning that are very grateful for those as well. Rachel, do you know something that Josie might be grateful for? Her little green paper, maybe also her big cousin that watches her a lot and loves her. Well, let's talk about love. I, I, I know that I really love coming up here and spending time with you, but I love each of you, and we know that God loves us. But does that really mean anything, that God loves you? Would that really mean anything? Does it really change anything? Yes, it changes everything. Because when you have, when, first you have to know that God loves you, and then you feel God's love for you. And when you feel it, it changes you. And the best story for this is in the Bible is the story of Zacchaeus, the little man in the tree. He was a bad man when he climbed up the tree, but then he got to know Jesus, got to know God's love, and he changed. So you may think that you can still be bad and do bad things, when you love God and God loves you, but that's not how it works. Okay, yeah, I know that's getting boring. All right, so Elsie's done, so we're all done. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear God, I am so, so grateful just for Sunday mornings up here with the kids with you. We are grateful for your love and pray that you will just help us to share it with others. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you pray with me? 
Father God, we're so thankful for this time and place where we can gather together and worship, for the beauty that you've written into this community, and for all the ways that you have proven yourself faithful to us. We thank you for all the ways that you've moved in and among us this past week, for all the praises that we're able to share with each other here today. We come as a thankful people, but also as a people in need, a people living in a broken and unjust world, a people who look around and feel overwhelmed by the suffering around us. So we turn our eyes toward you, away from the problems that we can't solve, and toward you knowing that you can. Together as a community of faith, we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the time of serving God with our giving, I just wanted to lift something up as a way that I feel like our congregation is getting loved and served. It's one of those things I had <clears throat> a similar conversation three times this week, and it wasn't until yesterday morning when I heard it for the third time that I thought, oh, maybe God is trying to tell us something. So all three conversations involved what role do our littlest people that we just saw up here this morning play among us? Um, <clears throat> and the conclusion that we reached was that even these littlest of disciples have this important part to play in our church with all of their energy and all of their openness, and that we need to encourage them to see that they have gifts to share with us, not just sometime in the future, but in the here and now. And then I was thinking about how we're being loved and we're being given this gift by another group of people, and we don't think about it, once we're out of the stage, but their parents are giving us a great gift by bringing those little ones here among us because it's not easy to be a parent of a young child in a worship service. So there's a lot of wiggling. Um, there are days when you go home and you think, I didn't hear a word that was said. Every like sound your kid makes seems so much louder to you. Every little distraction feels like it's super dramatic. But we need those kids here among us. And so I just wanted to say today, I am thankful for the families that bring them um, and that we recognize that that's a gift. And so at this time, we all bring our gifts to God.
Father God, we bring our gifts before you this morning, knowing that we each bring our own gift, and even if it might seem small to us, that together when we bring them and we put them in your hands, that you can do amazing things. And so we just release these gifts into your hands to the work of your kingdom. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal 
but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are continuing the sermon series on the prodigal God written by Timothy Keller. And today we're focusing on the two lost sons. So I find myself questioning, how could these two sons that were raised by the same parent turn out so differently? We have one that's responsible and hardworking and serious, and then you have the other that's the exact opposite. He is irresponsible, he's lazy, wild, and wasteful. How does that happen? Well, there's all these things that go into making us who we are. I think part of it is just personality. I told my little brother, I'm gonna point him out. Most of you know Ryan Stauffer, wave over there, if you don't know him. That's my little brother, and he and I are different people, right? We lived in the same house, we had the same two parents, and yet he is like, he loves people. Like, he loves being around people. You fill him up, and I love you, but I'm an introvert. So I also have to have some time by myself to fill back up. We do have it in common that we are both people pleasers. We have the hardest time saying no to anybody. But then when we end up with that to-do list of things to get done, I am nothing if not efficient. I like just check things off. Ryan, on the other hand, will sometimes procrastinate, but we're gonna give him a pass on that because he's just so busy loving all of you. <laughs> There's also the birth order. Right? So we know that that affects people is if you're the oldest child, the youngest child. I looked this up in like research and they said that this tends to describe oldest children. They are goal oriented, outspoken, independent, perfectionistic, responsible, determined, hard worker, cautious, and sometimes bossy. The younger child, words that tend to describe them, agreeable, outgoing, risk taker, fun loving, charming, easygoing, free spirited, charismatic, creative, dependent on others, and sometimes spoiled. And it totally makes sense, right? They have a completely different experience growing up. The first child gets 100% of their parents' attention and love, and the first child has those very like hovering, overprotective, cautious parents because they're first timers. The later ch children don't have that same experience. And so birth order surely plays into this. But I would argue probably our biggest thing that affects who we become are our life experiences. So a lot had to have happened before the one day when that younger son came and asked for the early inheritance. And the Bible is full of stories of family dysfunction and things that could possibly have gone wrong. When we look at the first siblings in the Bible, Cain and Abel, there's so much competition between them that Cain ends up murdering his little brother. And then you get to the family of Abraham and there's so much favoritism going on there. Abraham picks Isaac over his brother Ishmael. And then Isaac grows up 
to him and his wife Rebecca picking favorites between their twin boys. So Isaac prefers Esau and Rebecca favors Jacob. And that causes all kinds of conflict between the two of them. Jacob doesn't learn his lesson though. He grows up to play favorites between his wives, Rachel and Leah, and also between their sons. And all of that has happened by the 30th chapter of Genesis. So we have 1,159 chapters of the Bible left to go with all kinds of problems in them. But while it's interesting to think about what might have caused them to be different, we don't actually know. All we know is that they are. And can you imagine the relationship between these two brothers? That younger brother, with his scandalous behavior, would have driven his rule-following older brother absolutely crazy. But I would argue that the older brother wasn't easy to live with either. The older brother is no fun. He's always striving and competing and comparing. It looks like he lives to work. He doesn't work to live. And it seems like he will push aside any kind of fun or enjoyment until that day when he finally feels like he has enough. And I kind of feel like he's never going to get there. Nothing is ever going to be enough for him. And I wonder if the attitude and belief of that older brother isn't part of the reason that the younger brother leaves the family. But for all of their differences, these two brothers actually have a lot in common. Both brothers are enormously disrespectful to their father. So when the younger son goes to the father and says, can I have my inheritance early? He is basically saying to his dad, I wish you were dead. The older son refuses to go in and join the party. He is making a public display of his disapproval of the father. So both sons are willing to totally damage their father's reputation without a second thought. And I think that's because both sons seem to dislike their father. With all of his rule-following goodness, it's hard to see it in the older son because he's always working for the father, but he's not doing it out of love. And he's staying physically close to the father, but his heart is far away. The younger son dislikes the father too. He's just really honest about it. It seems that both brothers distrust the goodness of their father. The father's always moving toward them, but they're keeping their distance from him. The younger son is doing it by breaking the rules, while the older son is doing it by keeping the rules. And so both sons ultimately fail their father. It's easy to see it in the younger son. He wastes the father's inheritance on wild living. But the, younger, or the older son, he fails to do the one thing that the father most wants. He wants him to go out and get the younger brother back. And the older son simply refuses to do it. So true confessions. Growing up, I have always identified with the older brother. All that rule-following faithfulness. I never wanted to say that to anybody because I thought that that was pride. Now I don't want to say it to anybody for a different reason. Prodigal God showed you there's nothing to be proud of in being the older child. He's unforgiving. He's unmerciful. He doesn't make any allowance for the people that don't fit into the system as well as he does. And then the worst thing is he doesn't even realize that that's wrong, which I think leads us to a hard question. Are we ever acting like the older son? And is our behavior ever pushing away the younger son from the father's family? Do we ever strive, compare, compete, either individually or as a church, maybe against other churches nearby? Do we sometimes like the system of religion because we're good at keeping the rules and we're good at giving a little bit of time and money to a good cause? But then deep down we lack compassion or we feel resentment for the people we're helping, frustrated with them because they're not keeping up with the system. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all have to say yes to that, at least in some way. I'm going to ask you while you're being honest with yourself to go ahead and think of what it feels like to act like the older brother. And he tells us, he describes it as slaving for his father. Can you ever relate? Does it ever feel like there's this long list of rules to keep or these activities to do, these tasks to check off? and that you find yourself wondering, am I ever gonna be good enough? Or asking the question, is this really all there is? And if we're asking those kind of questions inside the church, is it any wonder that people outside the church might not be all that interested in what we have to offer here? And then we read stories in the Bible like 
the early church in Acts, and we think, how did that happen? They said that thousands were added to their number in a day's time. What are we missing? I'm not sure how many of you followed the Asbury Revival, but it's a very similar story. There's this college campus of about 6,000 students that attracted 50,000 people to their campus over a two-week period. They said that there were so many people showed up in that town that there were not enough bathrooms to serve everybody. Like, this is remarkable. And I find myself wondering, like, what sparks something like that? So I looked it up online. And luckily, there's this video that you can click on that says, the chapel service that sparked the revival. So I watched it. And in it, the preacher taught from Romans 12, 9 to 21. And he talked about how, of course, what sparks this kind of thing is love. And he goes down through these verses. There are 13 verses with basically 30 commands about how to love. Things like being devoted to one another, honoring one another above yourselves, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, don't be proud, don't be conceited, and don't repay evil with evil. He's describing agape. He's describing the love of God. It's perfect. It's sacrificial. It's unconditional. The preacher during the message explains the commands. He talks about the ones that are hard for him to follow. And then he says how it's kind of overwhelming when you look at that list, read one right after another. And then as the praise team comes back to the stage at what looks like the end of the service, the preacher the preacher steps out in front of the podium, right up to the people, and he says, the pressure is off. He says, you can't actually keep these rules of love all the time. He says, people have tried that. The Sadducees thought that it was all about knowing more. They knew everything, and it wasn't enough. And the Pharisees thought that if they just did more, that would be enough. And that's not what it is. The preacher said that what it is about is letting God love us. So after all the consideration of those two sons, what if the parable isn't even about them? What if Jesus is only telling this story in order to point to the one who it's really about, to point to the one that Jesus came to earth to show us? You see, Jesus is telling the story about a heavenly father. He's extravagantly gracious and loving toward us, regardless of our behavior. He's always moving toward us, trying to welcome us home. He's always trying to restore the relationship with his children, no matter what it costs him. And Jesus isn't just telling that story with his words and the parable. Jesus is telling that story with his life the entire time he's living it. Jesus shows us what love in action looks like. And it's a love not based on what we do, but on who we are. And the parable tells us who we are. We are the beloved sons and daughters of the Most High God. And who is he? He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And he claims us as his treasure. He says that we are the desire of his heart. The Asbury preacher reminded the people in the chapel service that we as Christians need to rise up as love in action for the sake of the world. But he said we do not do it by striving. He said we don't do it by telling ourselves we have to love because we're Christians. He said instead, we allow ourselves to be loved by God. We allow him to fill us up with his love until we're flowing over into the lives of the people around us. He says we love because God first loved us. So this preacher said that the first and most important step on the path to being love in action in the world is for us to prostrate ourselves before the love of God. That we have to sit before the Father long enough for his love to answer this terrible question that has been in the human heart for all time. Does our Father really love us? Is he really for us? So I want to leave you with a truth and a question today. The truth is that Jesus is love in action. He is the only one who has the power to transform our hearts, whether we're the older son, the younger son, or some mix of the two. But here's my question. Why do we have such a hard time accepting that love? Why do we have such a hard time accepting God's free grace? Why do we basically say, you're offering us the robe, freely given, because we're your sons and daughters, and say instead, like, oh, I think we'd rather be the servant, earning our way back to you. 
I would say, and I'm actually, Timothy Keller doesn't say this in his book, but the more I thought of it, I kind of feel like the parable doesn't tell us what either son chooses to do. So the younger son had come back to the father, and he had said, hire me as a servant so that I can pay off my debt. And the father says, no, no, I don't want any part of that. Here's the robe. You are welcome back. It's my grace. It's free. And you have to accept it without paying anything. That's the definition of grace. Will the son accept free grace, or will he instead insist on living the rest of his life trying to pay his father back? And the curtain closes with the older son still standing out at a distance, refusing to go into the celebration. Will he even realize that he's choosing wrong? And then know that we are all standing there in that parable with them. We are all the beloved sons and daughters of this gracious God, and we have all wandered away from him in our hearts. Sometimes we do it by breaking the rules. Sometimes we do it by following them really, really carefully. But no matter what, no matter if we tarnish his image, no matter if we look for our treasure elsewhere, that he is always there loving us. He's always there asking us to come home. Will you pray with me? Father God, this love is this love that we cannot even imagine because we live in a world where we just don't love each other like that. And so I ask that you will just work in us that in this upcoming week and as we uh, even just continue through our time here in church this morning, that you will help us to feel that love. You'll help us to believe that you actually do love us that much, no matter what we do. And that in feeling that love, you'll be able to live through us into loving the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
our world needs this group of Christians and all over the world to go out into the world as love in action, but we start by letting him love us. So as you leave this place to go back into your families, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, go knowing that you're loved. Go and love because he first loved us.